Um, I am really pleased to welcome Tam Hussein. Um, he is an award-winning uh, investigative journalist and writer. He has spent many years in the Middle East and uh, in North Africa, traveling, studying, and writing. He speaks an incredible five languages and holds an MA in Near East uh, and Middle Eastern studies uh, from SOAS. Tam will be telling us about his great uncle, Ayub Ali Master. Um, for a lot of you, and including myself, um, I've come across the story of Ayub Ali Master, and it's almost mythical. <laughs> um, you, you, you know, it's uh, it's it's almost like a, a tale. And um, to meet someone like Tam and say that's you know I, I came across this history and I I, managed, I I investigated my my family history and I came I have this personal connection to it. It's really uh, amazing to hear. So you're in for a real treat. Um, Tam will present for about thirty five to forty minutes. And then um, we will open it, open it up to questions. So um, please do get your questions ready. Please do engage with us on the chat box. You can post your questions there if, if you like. Uh, we'll always go in the order sort of that you post or just um, let us know what you're thinking. We'll come back to comments as well later on. So um, I'm gonna invite Tam to please uh, share his screen. I'm just gonna unmute. And I'm going to share this. Thanks. I hope, I hope we can see that. Can, we, can, can everyone see that? Yep, you're good. Great, uh, great. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm really, it's, it's a great privilege to even be talking to all of you guys. So um, thank you for this. Um, what I was going to say, I mean, this lecture is about Ayuba Ali Master and uh, well, really, also, of course, my grandfather, because his grandfather, Shamsul Haq, who, who trapped, they, they came together uh, to Tilbury Docks uh, in 1919, just as the war ended. Um, I suppose these two figures, you know, I, every time I walk down East London, East, the East End, I mean, I, I, I see every time I see the East, East London Mosque or the Brick Lane Mosque, I always remember, always think about, think about. My, my, my grandfather and my great uncle you know it's, it's just for me it's an undeniable aspect of it it's it's quite sometimes unfortunate that well I wish rather that other people knew about them you know um to be honest with it as an immigrant because I came here I came to the UK in 1991 from Sweden um and I wasn't quite sure of who they were I just thought that's my nana and that's and that's my great uncle in fact you know from what i heard you know these men my great uncle was like this myth you know like he was i i heard that he was he was a ship's captain and everything else it was only when i started the dig i realized actually there were lascars who was working working in in the kitchen or they were shoveling coal you know but you know th this is the this is these are the myths that we that i grew up with as uh, as i walked around the east end in fact um I remember my grandfather had taken me to the Burnes State to teach me Quran. Um, now there was a community center there. I'm not sure if that community is still there, but uh, there was a mullah there that would, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, this was, this was in 1991 and he would beat the kids. But he wouldn't beat me if I got it wrong because of who my grandfather was. Of course, thank God things have changed these days. But you know, that, that, and that, that's when I realized that, you know, hang on, this man, you know, the, the, my grandfather and Ayubali master was something. But I still, you know, coming from Sweden, most of the people in Sweden, most of the Bengalis in Sweden, were kind of from a non Bengali background, uh, non most of them definitely middle class. Some of them had fought in the independence war, very, um, na very nationalistic. And to the extent that, you know, I, I grew up speaking uh, Shuddhavasha, which is like, the I suppose the proper Bengali. I didn't. I, I only learned Sileti, the dialect or the language, when I came to the East End. So I had I had a uh, view of you know this community in, in the East End almost you know like it was a massive culture shock. You know you've got these uncles walking down um, the white chapel spitting this you know betel nut juice. And you had these guys with their henna beards. And I just didn't quite understand, you know, being 11 years old, what, what this community was about. But, you know, when I compare Sweden and the, the Bengali community in Sweden and I compare it to 
to the east, you know, to Bengalis living in the East End, and how one community in Sweden, for example, they've been watered down, and how, for example, the British Bengalis have really kept to their identities. I started to really appreciate what what this community and what some of you know what the Bengali community did did in the East End because they're still here. And they still retain the identity, whereas I feel, I suppose this is human history and human process. I feel that maybe this Bengalis in Sweden didn't really keep on to their identity, which, uh, and some of those values that they, they passed on, they kind of disappeared. Whereas when you look in the East End, you realize, wow, this is, this is quite an immense, you know, these people that I looked as quite, you know, almost as, you know, being selected myself, you know, we're country bumpkins almost actually did something. They, they established mosques, they established community centers, and they're still active. And it's it's to their you know to their credit, but you only realise that as you get older. Um, and I, as a journalist, I I'm someone who collects other people's stories. I never really looked at my own until actually by chance um, I'm I'm married to an Italian, so my children are Italian, uh, half Italian, half Bengali, um, and I started to speak to um, my children's great grandfather about. The war the second world war because i wanted them to you know because he, he passed away last year um last year may around this time and i wanted to collect his stories because i wanted my children to have to have that aspect then i started thinking hang on a second you know i'm, I'm you know i should really be doing the same thing with with the other side because london's a the sort of is, is a sort of city that just takes everything swallows it up and brings something new we, we you know we forget we forget that um you know, London is built, for example, on the backs of slaves, you know, on sugar and whiskey and all of these things. And, you know, there is no statue for these men and all these souls that passed away. We forget this. And, it, you know, it's and I it, and just thought I don't, I don't want the Bengali community, you know, in 10 years time, maybe the, the East End will be full of hipsters and there will, there'll be no Bengalis or 20 years. You know, we don't want to be I, I didn't want it to be a footnote. You know, I, I want the Bengali community and other communities to actually hang on. We're here and it's for us to really show that this is what we're about. Um, and why not? And that's what we should be doing. You know, the, London's and, and in fact, you know, I sometimes look at the kind of a wider English community, community who, who aren't aware of it. And these are blind spots. And it's for us to tell, tell our stories, I think. Um, so I started to collect the stories of my uncle. And, uh, and speaking to my parents and so on, who are these people? What, what were they? And I started to go looking into the archives and started to just check. These are oral traditions and oral histories, of course. So it may change, you know, it may change, but that's, that's the project, I suppose. Um, also, I felt to myself that there is a lot, you know, there is an old, old saying, which goes, young men think old men fools, old men know young men to be fools. Uh, in the sense that, you know, you have this intercommunal uh, aspect of it now where a lot of the younger generation are kind of poo-pooing on the older generation, looking at the timidity, the docility, uh, and the fact that maybe th th what they experienced and what they achieved were not, you know, of merit, that they just, uh, you know, but when I looked at what they experienced. You know, I remember listening to a story of an uncle who said, look, we used to walk down this road and we used to just face, you know, it was basically running across this road because of the racism and so on and so forth. And I wonder, you know, what thick skin that they had and they still worked and they still had this stoicism that you know, just have to ad admire that resilience. And I just thought, you know, now when you're 40, you've got children, you realize, hang on, you know, all this poo-pooing on the, 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 that, that the young people do on the elder, older people, maybe because I'm going on to the, to the other side, think, hang on a second, you know, wait, you know, they, they achieved something here and we should, we should recognize that, you know, despite all, you know, there, there is none of that. There were no laws, there, weren't, there were no laws against discrimination and so on and so forth. Anything, hang on, we, we have to really salute these people, men and women, you know, for what they achieve, our parents. So this is another kind of a response to that. Like, look, just, just remember what they did, you know, because we should, be, we should be thankful for that and we should take lessons from them as well. Their attitude, you know, from, from their attitude and the values that they taught, taught us. Because one of the things I realized, for example, when I was in Sweden, this is one thing that was lost. I, I felt that, for example, filial piety, loyalty and so on, looking after your own, looking out, you know, and these things are such immense, immense 
principles and values that we you know we shouldn't forget and especially with london when these values aren't as important you know it's about making money it's about trying to put food on the table we forget this and i thought this is another reason i wanted my children to know that you know when my when their dad's gone that this is where he comes from and this is his tradition so this is one of the reasons i started to to document these things um so and of course within that i realized i started to unravel, unravel other myths you know i was always raised on the idea i swear to god i thought that the bengalis introduced the whole world to tea i did not know that it was actually the brits who came down to the, to bengal and planted tea you know to you know to um uh, to bypass the Chinese, you know, the, 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 Chi the Chinese tea. And there was also other things like Siraj Dola. Siraj Dola, the, the Sultan who fought, General, uh, who fought Clive at the Battle of Plassey. Uh, he was always, you know, we were always fed this idea that, you know, Siraj Dola was betrayed by Mirza and all this kind of stuff. And Clive was really, really bad. But then you just, when you start going into it, you realize, wow, Siraj Dola was a pretty awful human being. So when you start un un unraveling all of these things, you realize, hang on, you know, th this, is, this is about self-knowledge. So I think that we, I think if anything, if we, we if we're going to, when you look into your pa past, I think that's one thing that you realize, you actually gain self-knowledge of who you are. And I would encourage everyone to, 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 to put down the stories for their children um, of who their parents were. Because as, as, as with great cities, they'll, they'll swallow it up and then put it and bring something new. And we want, we, we want to preserve these things for future gen generations. So this is one of the reasons I thought I would, I, I, I would give this talk for this purpose, for this reason. Because if we, if, we don't, if we don't do it, then who else is going to do it? You know, if people say, well, we didn't know about that. Well, we only have ourselves to blame. Um, one question that I always wondered when my grandfather uh, and my great uncle landed in Tilbury Docks was, you know, why exactly, why on earth did they even come? You know, they were Siletis. Siletis, um, let me change the slide. As you can see, as you can see here on the map, it's, it's landlocked. You know, there is no, there is really no reason for them to go to sea in many ways, you know, especially from the small villages that they, that they were from. They were from a place called Jogonatpur, Achol. Um, and so there, so I started looking into, looking into these, these aspects. Some people say it was because it was a, because they, because the British came and they planted tea there because of, because of the hills and their access to the sea. It was very, it kind of made it very, um, very accessible, and it, it encouraged people to to go uh, to sea because they transported the tea down to the to the uh, to the ports and so on. So this is one aspect. This is one reason. But also, other people said that you know deltas are just generally very very cosmopolitan, um, especially especially you know Bengal had been a center. For Tibet, you know, for Buddhism, and in fact, Tibetan Buddhism and some of the stuff that you see about the Dalai Lama comes from a Bengali guru, you know, um, who, who who traveled and settled and taught there. But also, when you look at when you look at uh, Silet, it was very cosmopolitan because um, of uh, of Hazrat Shah Jalal. Shah Jalal, I think every other mosque or restaurant will kind of be named after Shah Jalal. Uh, he's like the patron saint of Silet. Um, he was, this was in the, he came in the uh, 12, 30, sorry, he was born in the, uh, he was born in 1271 and he died in 1346. Um, some people say that he was of Yemeni descent, but it, Yemeni or Turkic descent. Definitely he was part of the Persian culture that was at that time dominant in the Islamic world. Um, and the myth, the, the story goes, is that he came to Bengal, came to a lot of the rivers with his devotees or murids, couldn't cross it. And when, this is what I was taught by my parents. They prayed on the carpet and they flew and they settled in a place called Srihopta, which was a Hindu, you know, which is a Sanskrit word for Silet, which, is, which meant it was a place for stones. Um, and they stayed there. And as my, as my family says, you know, they were just good. They just sat and worshipped God. And then the people around them came. There was none of this uh, Sharia patrol and none of that stuff. It was just being good and doing nice things to people. And people, people converted. 
Uh, and I suppose that that is something that if you look at the subcontinent, most of the most of the proselytizing was through, you know, saintly men who came up from these place, places. Of course, in the south of Bengal, it was traders. It was Yemeni traders who the Hindu kings were, were very impressed by them, gave them their villages to, to control and man, and they married into the local community. From the north, though, from the north of Bengal, you had, you had Turkish. You, I mean, it was done by conquest. Um, it was a political conquest, and then later, later it spread. Um, so a lot of people say that because of a lot of the devotees that settled with Shah Jalal, they always had kind of an outwardly look, you know, uh, I suppose an international look, because they were of foreign descent, right? So for that reason, they, you know, th this was instilled in their descendants and followers and so on. Um, I don't know how much, how much, uh, you know, how much, how true that is, but, you know, these are the two schools. Um, Bengal, is a, Bengal did have a seafaring tradition. I think William Dalrymple, brilliant historian, he talks about this in his latest books. Uh, he talks about, um, and in fact, you know, uh, you know when, the, when the British landed, they destroyed, they destroyed the, uh, the, the boat, you know, the, that, that seafaring tradition. And they, they, they used to have, you know, they, they, were, they had their own, uh, shipwrights and craft uh, and so on. I mean, that, that, that was destroyed with the East, um, East India Company and later on with, um, uh, with, with the empire. Um, and from there, possibly a lot of Bengalis went out. Now the word Laskar, right, or Lashkot, we call it in Sileti, um, this doesn't just include Bengalis. Right? This included Yemenis and it also included Somalis. And you find that, you know, they settle. And in fact, early Bengali communities settled and Somali communities settled in Cardiff. Uh, and you find some of these names, which are very strange, you know, Cowdery and things like this within, within the Welsh population. You realize, hang on, this might just be a Cowdery. I'm not quite sure. But, you know, it's, it's, worth, it's worth looking at because they did. They, they, they settled in these port cities and, you know, and, and married the local women and they became part of that population. Um, so, and, and they've been around since, you know, since Britain uh, became a maritime empire. Uh, we, have, we have accounts of Bengali, Bengali Lascars going into brothels in the East End, um, you know, trying to get their money back because they've been robbed and so on, you know, since, since, since the early days. Um, for me, what's interesting is there is one man who... A man called Iatisam Uddin, who travelled with the East India Company as a munshi, as a secretary, and he wrote a uh, wrote a beautiful book uh, on Blighty, his accounts on of, of England. Uh, and this scholar, actually, this man actually established or really crystallised Persian studies in um, in England in the UK, um, because of course Persian. Remember India. The subcontinent was dominated, you know, was dominated by, it was a Persian, it's a Persian influenced culture. So even Bengali as a language um, only became a language because when, when, when the Muslims came, they, they translated a lot of, um, a lot of, when they started translating the Persian poetry and Arabic poetry, that it became a written language. Before that, it was vernacular. It's almost like Dante, when Dante, uh, you know, Dante made Italian. You know, before that it was Latin. But of course, if you look at if you look at this slide here, you'll see that Sri Hotto, if you look at you've got Bengali on your right and you've got Sileti on your left. Now, what's very interesting about Sileti uh, is a lot of people believe that that language actually developed from the from Shah Jalal's people. Uh, and because there were a lot of Sufic sayings within that uh, and uh, in Sileti and so on. So a lot of people say that that's how it developed. Um, but that's just uh, that's just an aside. But if I were to say why my uncle and my grandfather came, it's probably money. That's probably what it was, you know. For all of these things I'm saying, it's probably because of money, because that's that's uh, what motivated a lot of young men to travel in those times, you know, to send to send money back home, as as is as is today. Um, and there is there is a saying that, from what my parents told me is that my great uncle uh, and grandfather, they had a small short stint in New York 
and then they came to Tilbury Docks. Now, some people have said that they were ex-Lascars. Other, other people say they were actually they were actually Lascars. They were, and Lascars here means they were essentially indentured laborers, in the sense that you know in those days the shipping company would contract you, and you would only get paid once you finish your contract. Now that contract went on for two years, it would have gone for five years. Now, can you imagine what difficulty? uh you know these these people would have suffered um and I, and the difference between difference between my uh my grandfather and ayub ali master was 14 years in age so ayub ali master was by far much older and he was you know and you know as an old in bengali culture you listen to your you, you listen to your old borobai you listen to the older so he was clearly clearly the leader in this um in in this partnership so my grandfather uh, and my and ayubali master uh, they came around in, to the eastern 1919 they are the, the six brothers and four sisters um and they landed and you know you, you you realize by about 2021 by about 2021 you know these guys that worked in the ship you know in the in the kitchen and shoveling coal or whatever they were doing they had, they had actually, you know, established a business. Uh, they had opened up a, ca a cafe on commercial street called Curry Cafe. Um, and from my understanding, I'm, I, I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, my understanding is that um, of the two, because I think um, Ayub Ali Master was the political man. You know, he was the, you know, let's say, let's call it the brains behind the operation, maybe. You know, um, I don't want, it's not like a Rodney trotter or anything like that but you know you've got only fools and horses maybe it's not like that but certainly you know i i i see my grandfather being he was he was the grafter you know he was the one who carried the carried the clothes and petticoat lane all this kind of stuff i'm not saying that you know my ayub ali master was lazy but i just i just sensed that because from the stories i hear that he was a lot in the kitchen uh trying to run this cafe uh while um Ayub Ali Master would maybe do the administrative stuff and so on. Um, by 1935, and that's the, this is the famous one, you know, they'd opened up Cafe Shah Jalal again uh, in homage to the great saint. Um, this was on 76 Commercial Street. Now, that catered for the needs of Indian and Indian Bengali you know, Sikhs, you know, all, all of these, uh, everyone from the subcontinent. So remember, there was no such thing as Bengali. I mean, they were, they were, they were Indian sailors. So everyone came. Um, and I remember my uncle, you know, being able to speak Urdu and, uh, and so on quite, quite easily. Um, and, and they were working towards, they were work, working, uh, working towards that. Uh, 1934 though, there was a, his one of one of Ayub Ali Master's friend, Shah Abdul Majid Qureshi, another another figure, uh, you know, in the early Bengali community, came along. He had followed in their footsteps, and they'd, they'd opened up uh, a a cafe called Dilkush Delight in Soho, which they were partners with. And from my understanding, um, who they were partners with, with these three men, they were literate. They were literate. They could read and write. I don't know how, I, I don't know why, um, but for this reason, and this is something that I've noticed even with myself. Um, I remember when I was, uh, when I, I lived in Damascus for about three years, and I remember every other Bengali auntie calling me and saying, listen, my son is coming to, coming to Syria. Please make sure that he's all right. And Maybe I could be quite, you know, I couldn't turn them down because I, fe I felt I had an obligation towards them because this is essentially where as soon as this is Baba, you have to do this. I have to do it. And I remember, um, and I I'll just give a side to it. I remember once I had a friend of mine who, he's, I don't know, for some reason, he could sleep for 24 hours, 48 hours. God knows. I, I don't know. It must be some sort of miracle. But the, but the man had slept for 48 hours. Now, when you're in Syria, you know, there's no way you can disappear. And this is a police state. So he had, he had, uh, I went to his house and he's not opening the door because he told me he, he, his passport had expired. And he told me, look, I'm going to Homs for, on, on an excursion, you know, to Palmyra. Because you have to go to Homs and then go into Palmyra, these, these, uh, these ruins. And 
he didn't come back or I thought he didn't come back. Of course, he was sleeping. He was, he was sleeping. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, I now have to, you know, I, you know because his mum has told me I'm going to have to go to Homs and speak to the secret police or something to get him out. Because otherwise, what is his mum going to tell me? And I didn't, I didn't feel that, that I, I was about to do anything. I just thought, this is, this is what a Bengali person needs to do because what's his mum going to tell me? What's his mum going to go and tell my mum about what he's going to do? And I felt like this is what my grandfather would do. I mean, you just you have to do it. And of course, thank God that when I knocked on the door, he woke up really, really happy to see me. Whereas I wanted to shake him, so wanted to tell me these things. But this is something that I've seen. You know, so I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that they were saintly men i just think to my you you feel obliged as soon as you meet a bengali guy another bengali just like okay you're a stranger here i'm gonna have to make sure that you're okay yeah i, I and i don't feel you know I, and i felt at that time that i was preparing myself psychologically that i need to go and fetch this guy from homs you know irrespective because what you know i, I gave my word to that lady you know Thank God it was, uh, he was just sleeping. But, you know, this, this, was, the, this was the idea that, that that's probably how, how, you know, the, uh, the 13 Sandy Lane came about, which is, which, which is initially the, this was a house where my, uh, my uncle, my great uncle and my grandfather stayed. Uh, and, you know, it was not a necessarily a nice place. It was very cold and so on, because from, from, from what my mum tells me, that you know he still had you know my 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 grandfather still had bad bad memories of that time and what would happen was these sailors would come now well, because because they had a contract with the with the shipping company they were almost kind of in hiding they just jumped ship and what do what do they do so they turned up to this cafe because of course you need to go to this cafe Shajalal, and they would then take them to india house register them at the police station maybe house them feed them write a letter and so on so th this is i don't i don't look at it necessarily that oh yeah he was uh you know my my great uncle um and and these men were doing this you know out of politics it's, i just felt to myself that this is something that anyone would do um i, I don't know how it is with other culture but certainly bengali culture i think there is this this, this idea especially if you know if, you know we seem to be related to each other somehow what village are you from oh i know your dad your dad's married to this dad and next minute you know you're related you know um so i could see how how these these things come came about um so these three men um shah abdul majid qureshi my uh, my grandfather and Ayub Ali Masa, these are the people that really helped the early early last gods come along and helped them to establish themselves. Um, now, 13 Sunday Street, as I said, started off as a place, you know, where, where they stayed, but it became, you know, it became almost like a boarding house. From my, from, from what I heard from my, um, from my parents and from my mum, you know, they said, they said that this was, this was not, you know, because of money, you know, this was something that they, they felt obliged that they had to do. They could write and so on. And this is, of course, where I think that the myth of uh, the master was attached, you know, because master means a teacher in, in Bengali, you know. Um, so they added that epithet and because he would write them letters to say, my son is OK, he's OK, and so on and so forth. Um, but whilst my nana, my grandfather, was a man who, you know, liked making money, I suppose, uh, and he, he really did have anything that he turned his money on. It seems to just turn to gold, it seems. Uh, Ayub Ali Master's, uh, you, know, you know, speciality was in politics. He was a political animal. Um, and I think, you know, when I look at kind of the politics that goes on in Tower Hamlets, you know, maybe, maybe that's, there's a tradition there just generally. I think, you know, I think maybe Bengalis love politics. Um, now, at some point in at some point he got i mean he he said he was involved in the indian seamen's union or league that was that was merely you know it, it started off as just looking after you know the welfare of indians you know one shilling one shilling a year and it was it was it was in christian street and it promised i'm going to read from here to look after the economic social and cultural interests of indian seamen to provide them with recreation in Great Britain and to communicate with their relatives in India 
in the event of any misfortunes befalling them. Um, and you know, that remember as well, a lot of Lascars joined the, uh, the merchant navy. You know, people, people, you know, people died and you, 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 someone needed to tell these, pe these people that your sons died. So th th there was a need for it. There was a need for it. Um, and again, I remember my mum say, talking about, you know, uh, them working during the Blitz and so on and so forth and how difficult that, that was during the Blitz. Um, so there was that need. And from that need, of course, a lot of Muslims, you know, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of these sailors were mu Muslims. And they were they needed to pray on Fridays. They needed a place to pray. So from that need, you know, East London Mosque began. So it's, the East London Mosque Mosque really was set up initially just to you know just to cater for the need of sail, sailors. And now look at look at where it is. You know, it's quite an incredible uh, development. But whilst, of course, with regards to remember around this time as well, if we put put this in the context of the rise of the Labour Party and trade union unionism and and uh, uh, and trade unionism in general, you could see what had authorities could look at these guys as being, you know, subversive. So of course they came. You know, there were files opened up about the Indian Seamen's League uh, and union and so on. It, although they claimed to be non-political, you know, of course the authorities needed to keep tabs on them because they thought you know, they might be subversives remember of course in india you've got lawyers in calcutta agitating for independence and everything else so it, it, within the context of that you could see why you know um why why the authorities might open up a file on file on ayub ali uh, and others and of course, there were there was there was the question of India because the Indian independence movement had begun, and that, of course, being an empire, you know, had had its uh, had its. Uh, I, sorry, I should actually change slides. Sorry, um, before before I go on, I, I should just say these are these. You could see the reason I'm showing these slides really here is you. This on the on your left is Ihtisamuddin. Yeah, the, the Persian, the, the one who came to the UK. Um, as you can see here, you've got some, some pictures of uh, Lascars, clearly not ships, you know, clearly they're not captains, you know, you could see you know, they, were, they, were, they were at the bottom of the ship. Um, and if you look at the, uh, at the picture below, you know, this is, again, this, the, the, this is where you, if you look, if you study the picture, you've got all sorts of people, black, white, brown, everything else. In the, in the east end so we you know the B bengalis followed a tradition uh, a tradition of um in, in the east end uh, and they were part and parcel of that life before i go on to the men on this is tilbury docks that's ayub ali on the top and that's my grandfather he's actually this is actually taken in pakistan uh well west pakistan um as he was going for business now we're on this slide here now um so indian independence uh was was something that ayub ali was very very interested in uh and the people that frequented his the, the cafe of course you've got uh krishna krishna menon uh they call him the kissinger of uh you know brilliant i mean a brilliant uh, he was nehru's uh uh, Nehru's second in command, and he was, of course, a head of head of uh, in, uh, head of the overseas branch. They were studying there. Uh, brilliant man. Um, they were, you know, the West saw him as an evil genius for Indian independence. He was, you know, celebrated. Uh, you have on the bottom bottom left, uh, Shubhas uh, Chandra Bose. Again, uh, another a Bengali, but an Indian nationalist and celebrated. Um, also attended, you had Mohammed Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, and Liaquat Khan, the first prime minister of Pakistan. They all attended, they all attended uh, uh, Shah Jalal Cafe uh, and had their meetings and so on. So you can understand that this was not just, you know, Shah Jalal Cafe was not a uh, Bengali thing. You know, it was, a, it was an, it was a subcontinent, it was, it was for people from the subcontinent. Um, and I realized that my, you know, my, my, my great uncle, he moved from 
being part of the All India League, to when Pakistan, when when that didn't seem to, you know, when when India as an idea switched to Pakistan, he switched to, you know, all Muslim uh, to to being a member of the All Muslim League and campaigned to have a Pakistan. And and this is important because we forget that. East Bengal, they, 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 and especially Silet, they actually voted to be part of Pakistan, part of East, you know, East Pakistan. And when the war, war happened, war of independence, as we know it, you know, not everyone supported it because this was about, you know, they looked at this as secession. Why would, why would one become, you know, become independent when one had, you know, a few, you know, 20, 30 years ago, been part of, you know, a campaign for, campaign for being part of a greater Muslim uh, Muslim state, Pakistan here. Um, and that, that's, that's something that we forget because there are such, so many contested narratives that do exist when we look at it, even to this day within, within the Bengali community um, and so on. By, by the time, um, af after independence, my great uncle, he, he returned back to he got he returned back to Bangladesh or, or East Pakistan uh, to his home to his own village, uh, married, and continued you know married and had children and 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 got involved got himself involved with with local politics. Um, my grandfather though he remained uh, he remained in the UK and. He remained in the UK and continued his businesses. Uh, you know, he set up Orient Travels in Brick Lane, uh, had branches in Karachi, London, uh, and London and other places from, from what I've been told. Um, he also set up businesses in Dhaka and he got married and he moved, moved his family to, moved his fa eventually moved his family to Dhaka. Um, but, at some point, at some point, I suppose this is almost like a Brexiteer, Brexiteer, Remainer kind of situation. He he decided that it was it was best. He became he was he was supporter of Awami League, a, a party. Uh, Awami means the People's Party, um, who 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 wanted independence, um, and he supported independence because he felt that you know culturally uh, they were not. Uh, culturally, they were not, uh, they were different. Uh, they felt, you know, uh, the, many of these grievances that Bengalis had, for example, they, they felt they were being economically exploited and so on and so forth. Uh, he, had the, he had this sense. I, I should say, though, that my paternal side was completely the opposite. You know, my, my paternal side, they, um, they were for, they, they, were, they weren't for independence at all. And my paternal side, my, my, my paternal grandfather was arrested for actually uh supporting to be together right um so you you know it split my family my own family in half uh and it's 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 very difficult you know it's hard to kind of navigate navigate that even you know as a bengali between these two between these two sides because it's such a it's so contested you know we forget that you know pakistan committed atrocities but we also we have to also remember that you know the nationalists they were you know they were also killing you know, so many Biharis and the massacres of the Biharis and so on. So we have to kind of, you know, I, I've covered the war in Syria, I've been in Syria, I know civil wars are bloody affairs, you know, um, and there's always these narratives running through and it's hard to navigate through these, through these is issues. My nana though, my grandfather, he was actually um, arrested in Pakistan, uh, in Karachi, um, and one of his colleagues, uh, Mr. Beg. He told him, look, if you want to escape you know, from this, this internment camp, um, join Tablighi Jamaat. Tablighi Jamaat is a proselytizing movement uh, who, you know, the, I suppose, closest thing you might get, uh, kind, kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll be knocking on your door saying, look, come to the mosque. Why don't you pray? Because, you know, if you pray, you'll get salvation. As well as, you know, the state of, the Muslim world will improve because it's because we're disobedient to God and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a, it's one of these uh, revivalist movements that began in India uh, as a response, actually, as a response also to colonialism. 
we forget that. Um, so he, he, he thought, okay, I'll join this movement and I'll get out of jail. Basically. That's, that's what it was. Um, my, my grandfather was a, was a they, they were both great uncle, but they were devout men, but in the sense that, you know, they did their prayers and they fasted and so on and so forth. That's what they did. But, you know, some, he became a, I said, uh, the equivalent of a Bible thumper, I suppose, because next minute, you know, he's popping off to Bay, you know, Beirut, Tripoli and everywhere else spreading the word as it were. Um, letting his business go to ruin and rack. Um, it only, and, and, and my mum says that she, she would receive these letters once in a while from all of these different places. And it's during this period that, that uh, Brick Lane Mosque, Brick Lane Mosque, he, he came in the 70s, uh, that, that Brick Lane Mosque, he was one of the founders of Brick Lane Mosque, actually. Brick Lane Mosque, as many of you know, they were, they were, they were, it was a synagogue, it was a Wesleyan chapel, it had a lot of these, and this is where, this is where they established it, established in 1974. Um, and after my, my grandmother and his son, his son was, uh, was murdered, that's when everything kind of, he started to just calm things down, I suppose. And, I, and by the time we, we came, you know, he, he, was, he, he was just involved uh, his businesses were, were to, had been taken over by his sons. Um, by, but, but, you know, he, his business had been taken over by his sons and he had more or less, more or less retired. And both men, they um, passed away in, in, in Bangladesh. That's the end, I suppose, of my uh, Ayub Ali master and my grandfather. Uh, and I hope, I hope this will inspire you to actually do the same, you know, uh, whether you're Bengali or whatever you are, I see a lot of, you know, different, different colors and different backgrounds. Uh, you, you have to take down your family's history. I would encourage you, I mean, find my past, for instance, is brilliant. You know, you've got archives there, find your, find, start with your, with, with a birth certificate. There's also shipping records on some of these websites. Get the shipping records, speak to your family, record them. Even if you think oh, I'm not going to write this, you know, just record their voices, keep their voices. Because your children will listen to these voices and go, wow, you know, three years down the line, you know, four, you know, 40 years down the line, these voices will be preserved, you know, right? And I hope, um, I hope that, you know, we could then, you know, come together and, you know, enrich the history of, history of this country. Because I think, I think uh, with all of these movements going on now, it, it's, it's wonderful that these movements are highlighting that there are other people outside uh, there are other people apart from, you know, you've got the wind rush, you've got all of these things going on right now. And it's wonderful that we can now realize, okay, now is a time that people are kind of paying attention. And some of this stuff are, are just blind spots. It's not necessarily uh, racism. You know, when I say to you that, you know, Muhammad Ali was Bengali, you might say, well, what's going on? But he was, he was given Bengali nationality. But it's not, well, you won't know that until I tell you that. You know, it's not, it's not the fact that it's nothing to do with racism, none of that, it's just blind spots. You know, okay, look, here you go. And you're like, oh, I didn't know that. And I hope, I hope that um, this will be, a, this, this will enrich London and actually be a testimony to what, what this country is about. You know, this country uh, tends, you know, it's, it's so, especially now, it's so accepting. You know, I, I, I personally, uh, you know, it's, it's, when it comes down to, you know, there's, there's no country bar none that, that can beat this in terms of the diversity, in terms of all of this kind of stuff, in terms of the fairness of the people. And I hope, I hope that we will, uh, we will take advantage of Tower Hamlet, the archive that are in Tower Hamlet and so on. And I'm going to close it there. Thank you very much for listening.